shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on the happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Good morning. I hope that you've had a great start to your Easter Sunday and are encouraged even in these difficult and different times. I know this is an Easter unlike any of us have ever experienced, but I'm so grateful to be able to say that no matter what our days may look like, we know with confidence that Jesus Christ has indeed risen from the dead. So thank you for joining us this morning. I pray you're encouraged. And I want to share something with you that may cause you to think just a little bit less of me, especially if you are a coach of some kind. But I, I want to share this with you just because I, I don't want to cause any type of doubt or misunderstanding about who I am as a person. And here it is. I despise track season. I just do not like it. 
I do not care for track in any way, shape, or form. It is of no disappointment to me that the Summer Olympics have been postponed. I'm perfectly fine with that because I just do not care for track and field events. Now, that being said, I do appreciate the fact that those who participate in these track and field events are very, very talented athletes. They are people who have a lot of discipline in their lives. They give themselves fully to the task before them, and they compete at an impressive level. So I have a great appreciation for them, even though I really don't care too much for the sport in which they participate. Now, one particular part of track is interesting and that is the passing of the baton between those who are running in a relay. You know, it it really is incredible the amount of time which those athletes have to put into in order to competently and purposefully pass the baton one to another. They're having to match a, a stride, match a speed. They're having to make sure that the placement of the baton is correct. They're making sure that uh, the one receiving it has a good firm grip on it before the one passing it lets go. And so there's a lot of coordination and timing that goes into passing that very important baton. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul was writing to the believers in Corinth and he reminded them of the very important gospel which he had passed on to them and which they had received. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So notice what Paul says there. He says that I want to remind you of the gospel. It's the gospel which I preached, which I passed on, which I communicated, which you received, which they latched onto, and that same gospel by which they are being saved. So notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying, I have passed something on to you. You have received it. You have accepted it. It has had some kind of impact or effect on your life. And now I want to remind you of it. And that's what he does starting in verse 3. I love 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. Paul says, Now what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. So notice what Paul is saying there. Again, he's saying he's passed something on to the Corinthians that he himself had already received. He had received it from the Lord Jesus Christ. But that word translated as passed on means to pass on to another what one knows. It's speaking of oral or used of written tradition. It's something that you hand down to someone. It is a special delivery. That's what the gospel is. It is a special delivery delivery. Now we know a little bit about special deliveries. Already we were a very online shopping culture where we just enjoy working through Amazon and putting things on our wish list. Like right now on my wish list I have a a 3D uh, pig target for archery and uh, probably a 3D antelope target for archery and all these other things. I just love being able to put these things on my wish list that are little subtle hints to Deanna, I'd really like one of these. But can you imagine how excited I would be if I actually hit the order button and then I was just waiting uh, one day after another for, for that delivery to come in? You know, we're already an online purchasing culture, but now it seems like that's exploded because we're encouraged all the more to, to order what we can online. And so we wait with anticipation for that special delivery to show up at our homes. Well, the message that Paul delivered to the Corinthians was the most precious of any message. It was the specialist of special deliveries, the gospel. He said, what I received, I passed on to you as of first 
importance. I delivered this special to delivery to you as the most important of things which you could receive. But I want you to notice something. Before Paul could tell the gospel to the Corinthians, before he could pass it on to the Corinthians, he first had to receive it himself. This doesn't just mean that he had heard it or that he had learned it, but that he had accepted it as truth. And Paul is saying, that which I accepted, I passed on to you, and you accepted it as well. So think about what he says the gospel is, starting in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. He says that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, Christ is the, the term Messiah. It's the title which the Old Testament Israelites referred to looking forward to a deliverer, one who would deliver the people of Israel to say, that Christ is the deliverer who died for our sins means that, first of all, we are guilty of sin. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The distinction which Paul makes in that verse is not that some sins are worse than others. The distinction that Paul makes is that every single one of us Men and women, boy and girls, we have all sinned. We're all guilty of sin. So Christ died for our sins. The second thing we have to understand when we're saying that Christ is the deliverer who died for our sins is that we're saying we cannot deliver ourselves. I cannot deliver my own self from my sin. You cannot deliver your own self from your sin. The most A celebrated person in all the world cannot deliver himself or herself from sin. We have to be delivered. Paul speaks about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. In the first few verses of Ephesians 2, Paul speaks about how we were all dead in our sins. But then he speaks of the movement, the activity of God, starting in verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The prophet Isaiah spoke of this in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Isaiah chapter 53, starting in verse 4, we read this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us, and with his wounds we are healed. All we turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. To say that Jesus is the Messiah, the Deliverer, means that we're guilty of sin. It means that we cannot, could not deliver ourselves. It is to say that Christ is the one who stood in our place, paying the punishment for our sins. Paul then goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to say not only did Christ die for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, but also in verse 4, that he was buried. Now there is not a drawn out burial procession or process that takes place in the Gospels. You can read about this in John chapter 19, specifically verses 38 through 42, where we read that Pilate granted to Joseph of Arimathea and to Nicodemus the body of Jesus. This is the same Nicodemus that we read about in John chapter 3, who has that important dialogue with Jesus Christ, where Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took Jesus' body and in haste they buried him in a tomb which was nearby to where Jesus died. This was not a drawn out ordeal. This was an expedited burial. 
Now, there are a lot of people who are beginning to be able to relate to this expedited burial today because of the coronavirus. But because of that, we're not being able to have our, our normal grieving routines and, and funeral services and celebration services for those that are believers who have gone on to heaven. Because of the state in which we're in, people are having to expedite these burials. And that's what happened in Jesus' day. Jesus' body was very quickly laid in a tomb. But then Paul says this in verse 4, that he, Jesus, was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now that Greek word translated as raised means to cause to return to life. Okay, this is a very specific word. It's not saying that Jesus had some underlying medical condition that made it appear as if he was dead. This is saying he was fully and completely dead, but he was caused to return to life. You see, that's the power of the Father working in the Son. Jesus was alive. Jesus died but Jesus is alive again. You know, that little statement, according to the Scriptures, you may wonder, well, what Scripture is being referenced? It's a reference from the Minor Prophets. In Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, after two days He will revive us. On the third day He will raise us up that we may live before Him. You know, two times Paul uses that phrase, in accordance with the scriptures. And I don't want us to miss the significance of that phrase in accordance with the scriptures or according to the scriptures. Here's, here's the significance of this. God has done that which he said he would do. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Both of those are statements which God had said he would do and he has done them. But I also want you to know this. God will do what he has said he will do. God will do what he has said he will do. Let me share with you just a few of those things which God has said he will do that he is going to be faithful to do. The first is this, Jesus will return. Not only has he risen from the dead, but he's ascended into heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father today, but one day God promised Jesus is coming back. We can read about this in Revelation chapter 22, verse 20. You know, I want you to think for just a moment about the, the final words that you say to someone. It might be saying to a spouse before they go to work, I love you, or be careful. It might be saying to your children before they go off to college, be smart, seek the Lord. It may be any of these things, but the last thing we say in a conversation with someone else typically is the most important, the final spoken words of Jesus Christ that are recorded for us in the scripture. Revelation chapter 22 verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Notice that. Surely, says Jesus, I am coming soon. John in response to that says, amen. Come Lord Jesus. And that's what we are to say in response as well. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus has said he's coming again. He will come again. Something else that we can understand that God has spoken and God will do is God has said that mankind will be judged. Mankind will be judged. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, and just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins for many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Jesus is coming back. And there's a couple things we need to understand about that. Those who are apart from Christ 
will spend eternity in hell separated from him. This is what we read about throughout the Bible, but especially in Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15 says, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in them, up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's a statement that God has made that is going to come true. But we also know this. God has said that those who have been forgiven in Jesus Christ will spend eternity with Him in heaven. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, we read this comforting passage. Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you also may be. God's going to keep his word. You know, today you may find yourself to be in a state of waiting or in a state of indecision about giving your life to Jesus Christ, about confessing your sins, confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You may be in a state of indecision today, but I want to tell you this. God does not wait for man before he moves. God moves and acts when he determines to move and act. God has a perfect plan. He and He alone, the Father alone, knows when Jesus is coming back. God and God alone knows that perfect plan that He has for your life. And God and God alone knows the number of your days. You don't. Neither do I. Now, I want to share something with you that I want to share it in gentleness because I I know it's a heavy thing. But I think it really just illustrates the magnitude of what it is we're talking about today. A few weeks ago, the pastor of Moberly Baptist Church in Longview, Texas, uh, tragically passed away in a car wreck. Eight days before Pastor Glenn passed away, he tweeted out of Psalm 139, verse 16. And he was tweeting this, making this statement in response to the coronavirus and all that was going on and all the fears that people had. Listen to Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Notice that. Eight days before he passed away, Pastor Glenn agreed with the psalmist saying, God, in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. He had no way of knowing that in just over one week's time, his days on earth would be completed. But here's the good news. Pastor Glenn was ready to stand before his God. Are you ready? You don't know the number of your days. You don't know what time is left. But you can know this with 100% certainty today. You can spend eternity in heaven with God if you'll give your life to Jesus Christ. So if you're interested in doing that today, I'd like to ask you just wherever you are to join me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I come to you today confessing that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I'm not worthy of your forgiveness. But in the name of Jesus Christ, 
I ask that you save me. Father, today I confess Jesus, the one who died and rose again, as Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer today, I want you to know there's rejoicing in heaven, but there also needs to be rejoicing here on earth. So will you share with us your decision and reach out to us so we can share with you more of what it means to walk as a follower of Jesus Christ? Our church phone number is 903-769-2199. My email address is pastor at fbchawkins.org. Would you reach out to us? so we can encourage you. Thank you for joining us today, but all the thanks ultimately goes to God, the one who sent his son, the one who raised him from the dead, the one who has proclaimed that salvation is found in no one else. Glory be to God, for his son is risen today.